did you know? In 2021, there were 883 major crimes committed in Belize. This was an absolute decrease of 0.6% or a marginal 5 cases compared to 2020. The country's crime rate was 205.3 per 100,000 inhabitants. This was a rate decrease of 3% compared to 2020 and a 40% decrease since 2017. Preliminary figures for 2021 show that Belize had the second highest murder rate in the Central American region at 29.1 murders per 100,000 inhabitants, ranking only behind Honduras at 38.2 murders per 100,000 inhabitants. For the period January to December 2021, May had the highest number of major crimes committed at 95 and January had the lowest at 58. In 2021, burglaries accounted for more than half of all cases, while almost one in five were robberies. There has been a 23% or 23 case increase in murders from 102 in 2020 to 125 in 2021. In 2021, there were 238 arrests. A little less than half were for burglaries, and one in five were for robberies and murders respectively. The district with the highest number of crimes was Belize with 366, while Toledo registered the lowest at 30. For more information, visit our website at bco.gov.bc. The Belize Crime Observatory. Inform. Interpret. Influence. Crime Observatory, we welcome you back and uh, we are having our conversation now with a number of different representatives. We have uh, Adeli Ramos, who is a rep the project coordinator and interim technical coordinator for Belize Crime Observatory and InfoSegura Belize. We have with us as well the superintendent of prisons and CEO of the Kobe Foundation, Virgilio Murillo. We have Mar uh, ASP Martha Reese, who is the officer commanding the Domestic Violence Unit, Eastern Division of the Belize Police Department. And we have Jian Cho, who is the Executive Director of the National Forensic S Science Service. Yes, Good, morning. Good morning. Yes, uh, some heavy hitters this morning. <laughs> we may need uh, more than a half hour. <laughs> but thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. So I, I want to start off with just a, a clarification. Um, I know it's very important for you, Adele, for us to Adele, for us to be accurate. Um, the data we talk about from 2021 so far does not include all of 2021 because December is still being tabulated. Good morning, Marlene. Good morning, Belize. Yes. Uh, yes, for some of the data, but we do have some of the categories completed. So for example, the major crimes data has been compiled. Um, we are still awaiting some of the more finer details that would help us to do more in-depth analysis, but we do have the aggregates. We do have the preliminary information, um, especially from our core agencies, and that is what we have to present to you today. With respect to the domestic violence, we still have December pending, but we do have up to November 2021. Okay. So there's a lot of data to cover, and I want to mm -hmm. jump right into it. Um, let's talk about some of the, the trends that we are, have seen so far for 2021. Do you want to start us off, Adele? Sure. Yeah. So let me just explain that the Belize okay. Crime Observatory sources data from some of its key partners, including the Belize Police Department, the National Forensic Science Service, the Belize Central Prison, but we also do receive data from the Ministry of Health and Wellness through the Epidemiology Unit, and that allows us to get a more complete picture of the situation with respect to citizen security. And so 
we have, despite the pandemic during 2020, been able to continue our interagency data sharing. And, and of course, that continues. It's very important for that information to be available to not just the public, not just our agencies, but to policymakers and decision makers. Uh, one of the key ones being Minister Karim Musa in cabinet, where you know that is the chief policymaking arm of the government. Yeah. And so the InfoSegura project funded by USAID and co-implemented by UNDP is very critical in this regard because they do support evidence-based policy and decisions. Mm -hmm. And so routinely there are reports produced uh, on a monthly basis, not just reports, but other information products. And so this information really and truly is critical for us to be able to know what is happening in various sectors across the continuum of justice. Now, what we saw in, in 2020, of course, during the pandemic was a major reduction in certain categories of crime. And early on, after we had the lockdowns and what have you, we saw, for example, like robberies, burglaries, okay. those types of property crimes going way down. Yeah. Right. Um, of course, it was expected, and also it is expected that with the relaxation of measures, you would then see an increase in certain categories of crime. Um, and so knowing that our policymakers and law enforcement could be proactive because you could predict certain things. Yeah. So the data is important in that regard, where we saw, for example, uh, in the Southern Belize for the earlier part of 2021, property crimes being more of a concern than they were previously. And so you saw where there was that response from law enforcement to be proactive, right? Yes. When it came to, for example, domestic violence globally, it was said to be like a pandemic within a pandemic. Yes. And again, there were proactive measures. We saw where a new hotline was launched where people could report not just if you are in the situation, but if you know of somebody in the situation, you can also assist. And so all these things together help to mitigate uh, what we expected and what could have been really a much worse situation. But what, where we saw there was the greatest challenge, I think, was with respect to violent crimes. Yeah. And you know, Belize has been struggling with this, not just today, but for over a decade, yeah. um, gang violence, and especially gang violence in the Belize city area in what are known as precincts one and precincts two. And we had the states of emergencies in 2020, and then we had another phase yeah. this year. And what happens is that that is a response to what is often deemed to be a situation that needs a uh, urgent intervention. Interventions can vary and interventions need to be multi-sectoral. And what we see now is that the agencies that can help to address the root causes of crime are being engaged and need to be engaged and I think need to be engaged even more and not just the agencies, but there needs to be a whole of society approach because this is not just a problem for the police. Yeah. This is a problem for all of us. You know, and so everybody needs to take ownership of the entire situation and not just point fingers and say, it's your, it's your job, it's your problem, it's our problem, yes. right? Yeah. And taking that whole of society approach, I think, can really make a substantial yeah. difference I've in always, numbers that we're seeing. Yeah. One of the things I think you're, you're, you're um, referencing in terms of looking at violent crime, like always, mm -hmm. unfortunately, count murders like it's a hobby and and you know we talk yeah. about lives lost families devastated and and uh wider Definitely. ranging impacts than that but looking at it by a week to week or month to month basis never actually gives you the picture um what we saw in right. that opening image the murder rate per capita is a critical part um and, it, and in 2021 when you look at the numbers in total uh, I really found it interesting, some of the data that you sent, that this is the first increase we've seen um, in a few years. Do you want to expand on right. that a bit? 
Right. And like I said, it was expected yeah. because of all the measures and the restrictions that were in place in 2020. It was expected because the dip that we saw in 2020 was directly related. Yeah. Right. And like I said, where we had the challenge was with respect to especially the Belize City area and gang violence. We saw where for example, there was an expansion of, of gang activity outside the core area. Mm -hmm. And we saw, for example, where places like Punta Gorda and San Pedro saw an uptick in gang violence. Yeah. So, you know, these, these things don't stay the same over time. It's very dynamic. Yeah. And that's why we also emphasize and we support the spatial analysis because the spatial temporal an analysis because it changes over area mm -hmm. and it changes over time. It's absolutely <laughs> very dynamic. And that's why it's important for us to have the georeference data. Mm -hmm. I, I know heat maps are often something that people look forward to, but it's going deeper than the heat maps. Yeah. You have to look, for example, at communities, at areas, not just at the district level, yeah. but get into the finer, yeah, the yeah. finer details. I'm curious to definitely. know how you um, collected data for the domestic violence, um, especially during um, this pandemic, right, from, from 2020 to 2021, uh, seeing that there was probably an increase in domestic violence due to the lockdown. Uh, can you explain more about how you were able to collect that data and the difficulties in collecting that data? The data that we have on domestic violence, it comes from the police department yeah. mm -hmm. and it is collected um, from the different policing areas, formations. And so I think I could ask Ms. Reese to explain a little bit more about that for you. Yeah. But we did see where, especially in the earlier part of the lockdowns, where you did have that initial increase. And then, of course, measures were put in place. And so there was a mitigation there. Um, what you're showing there is the, the murder incident. Yeah, this isn't, um, this isn't did, domestic violence. This is the murder heat map that yeah, we were talking yeah. about before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so sadly too, we saw where there were some cases of murder that were linked to domestic violence. And there were, you know, this year, two double murders that were linked to domestic violence, mm. which, you know, definitely it was very heartbreaking. I mean, each murder, each life lost, because yeah. it's not just a statistic, you know, this is somebody's loved one. I lost a loved one this year. I've lost, you know, close family members during the course, course of time. So this is very personal for me too. Yeah. I'll hand over to Miss Reese. Yeah. Miss Reese? Reese, you're still there? Yes. Maybe you're on mute? Yes, I'm okay. here. Good, Good morning. morning. Yeah. So let, let's let's talk about, about the domestic violence data. It's, um, you, you have several measures. You have one, just complaints that are made mm -hmm. each year. How many people yes. call in to, or go in to make a report? Yes, we do. Um, so let, let's talk about what, 20, what we saw in 2021. Well, in 2021, um, yes, we did have a, um, a decrease. We, we didn't really have an increase. Mm -hmm. And uh, with 2020 and 2021, um, that could be attributed to um, the pandemic because, you know, although we know that um, they can make a report, some people, you know, the outreach when it comes to them coming in, you know, with the vaccination and everything in 2021, um, you know, they say if you're not vaccinated that you can't come to, you know, come to a um, government building or a, pub yeah. or a space that the public is, has access to. And in a, in a way that has caused a little of the decrease because people do not know that they can come. I mean, we are the police and they're affected, it's crime. So we have to deal with them, you know, because we do not want that it escalates to something more serious. Yeah. Um, so that is one of the factors I would say. And when it comes also, um, we had incorporated since 2019, um, the service, a counseling service. Mm -hmm. So that has also assisted in the decrease because that, that, you know, repeat situations are being dealt with 
and it has really come in handy where that is concerned. Yeah. But um, the counseling has... service is only in Belize City, but countrywide, it's the, it's the same across countrywide. Yeah. You know, persons not knowing that they can still come in even if they're um, not vaccinated. How has the hotline helped? Well, the hotline um, for last year, it was incorporated. We had a text. We had a cell phone incorporated yeah. um, because we have always had the BTL hotline. Mm -hmm. And that is calling. Mm -hmm. So the text, the, the line with the smart line, it's an addition. So you don't necessarily have to call in. Mm -hmm. You can text in the information and then the police will follow up from there. Yeah. You know, but um, still it, it is a challenge. Yeah. It there, is still a challenge. There typically yes. is an assumption made, um, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the number of reported cases is only, you know, a small percentage of, of the actual incident rate or the actual yes. number of incidents. Yes, that's true. Yes. That's true because um, we only respond to what um, the situations that reaches us. Yeah. Right. And we do know that there are other situations. Persons are not coming in because if we look at some of the incidents, mm -hmm. And not um, to speak personally um, about this situation with um, my own colleague, mm -hmm. you know, and her daughter. Sometimes people believe that, you know, all reports that police has knowledge of or, or have, have had some access to at some point. But some persons believe that, you know, it, it, it's still taboo with them. Mm -hmm. So they would not want to come in to make a report. So there, you you would believe that we have knowledge of all situations, but that is not true because some people simply just do not report it. Yeah. Right. I also notice here in your um, in your summary, your statistics, sorry, that there are no um, reports about suicides. It is not included in your um, in your case reports. Uh, why is that? Um, well, when it comes to um, suicides, um, it's not, it's, it's no longer considered a crime, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's, it's not included for that purpose. Can you explain why as not? As part of statistics. Can, can, you, can you give more um, clarification as to why it's and not considered a crime? First, it used to be a crime. It used mm -hmm. to be in the um, laws, but it's, mm -hmm. it's no longer considered a crime. So that, that's why it's not there. Um, we still respond. We still have a duty to respond because all sudden deaths, yeah. we have to, um, they have to make a determination because not necessarily because they said it was a suicide that, that um, it is, you know. Mm -hmm. All deaths have to be investigated. Yeah. So, um, but once it's classified as suicide, it's not considered, it's not a part of the statistics overall. And speaking of investigation, that gives us a great segue over to uh, the forensic services, Jian. Yes. Uh, you know, looking at, at the data that, that we've been provided so far, um, you know, it seems that uh, you've been doing more work. And I know you've actually gotten some, some new equipment and uh, skilled persons as well. Let's talk about uh, what the forensic services saw in 2021. Thank you and good morning again, everyone. Yes. Um, just to jump on what um, Ms. Reese was talking about with suicides um, and the data set that Ms. Ramos had provided to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, suicides uh, is a category that's flagged for this year because it's actually um, higher than in previous years. Um, and I believe uh, Crime Observatory put together the trends since over the past decade. Um, the figure that we got for last year, uh, 43 um, deaths due to suicide is actually one of the highest since 2008, if not the highest. Um, so there is uh, an epidemiological need to dive deeper into that particular statistic um, to try to find out what type of interventions or support services is needed from the yeah. various um, stakeholders or sectors involved in mental health. Um, so that's one of the the values that um, combining data and comparing across the agencies provides is that you can actually pick out trends that stick out and prioritize, um, allocate new resources or new interventions to try to target it, as Ms. Adelis said. You know? So um, looking at data in this way, we can we can make more informed decisions and try to, through the ministry, and the, the ministry has been put out, putting a lot of effort on the 
preventing the root causes of crime. Yes. Um, but when at the end of the year, when we compile our annual reports, which we're doing right now, we, we come across other um, statistics other than crime, as Ms. Uh, Reese said, suicide is not necessarily a crime, um, but th there is a need, a public health need, a citizen security need to look at how we can also either address the root cause of crime or uh, sorry, of, of some of these um, types of incidents, yeah. um, or also employ corrective actions. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that we look at is homicides from forensics. So we, our department, um, since 2018, we started to regularly share fatality data with the crime observatory. Um, we later started to share crime scene um, categories, meaning the types of incidents that our crime scene technicians respond to, just to kind of correlate, gather more data points so that crime observatory can validate data, cross-reference, and clean the data better. Now. Yeah. Um, the laboratory data set, we have not yet um, begun to integrate, but we do want to try to, to do that um, this year. But looking at fatalities, uh, homicides, if you look at the number that we have for last year, it's 141, if I am not mistaken. Um, and just to clarify, so you said murder um, is 125. Why is homicide 141? Well, well homicide yeah. is a, a generic def definition. Homicide means the death of a human um, caused by another person. So the death of one human being caused by another human being. Not necessarily murder. Murder is a, a charge. It's due to a charge that's brought on by the... Um, justice system and there's a, a legal context for that but homicide itself is strict definition uh, one person dies as a result of action from another person so it in includes categories like manslaughter um, it includes categories like induced abortion of fetuses things like that so you, you'll see 141 well, this year okay um, but that that's a, a large an umbrella category which includes murder okay so I, I want to go back to your your top 10 categories um, where your scenes of crime goes to process. I was very surprised when I saw that your, your top category was uh, traffic incidents. Yes, um, so any, any kind of crime scene or accident scene, um, a crime scene technician needs to respond to it. They're required by, uh, as part of the, the um, legislation, no? Mm -hmm. To support law enforcement in gathering evidence, and that includes photographic documentation of the scene, um, so even minor traffic accidents, scenes of crime have to deploy um, to take photographs and collect any evidence that may end up being used to press charges or may end up being used in court. doesn't always end up in, in court, no? But yeah. we do need to preserve the ability to prosecute the crime. So they have to respond to the scene regardless of whether a crime has been committed. Um, but yeah, it is a, a huge strain on resources um, across the country to to have a limited number of technicians to respond to all of those scenes. So yeah. road traffic accidents um, was one of the main types of scenes that um, crime scene technicians respond to, followed by burglary. Mm -hmm. um, you also have uh, damage to property, then shootings, um, the homicide or the death scenes. Um, those are some of my top categories. Yeah. Now let's let's talk about uh, autopsies for homicides. Um, you have a, an increase in forensic autopsies um, of 24% in 2021. Do you want to expand on that a bit? Yes. Um, so the medical examiner's office, um, they investigate all sudden, suspicious, unexplained, yeah. violent, or accidental deaths. Um, so what we've seen over the past 10 years is that percentage of total deaths for the country mm -hmm. has steadily increased um, that our medical examiners have to investigate. Right. So the total deaths for Belize um, for 2021, for instance, it's it's a little over 2,000 deaths. Um, in previous years, it's somewhere around 2,000, a little over 2,000. Um, so that, that's that's just uh, the annual statistics for death certificates. A uh, quarter of those deaths are the medical legal deaths, the, the deaths that our examiners or forensic medical examiners yeah. have to conduct post-mortem exams um, to try to gather evidence for to help law enforcement, but also to certify the cause and death and the manner of death if possible. So last year we found, or sorry, we had a caseload of over 550 uh, post-mortem examinations uh, conducted. A uh, big increase from previous year because of well, the, the lockdown, uh, most or, or deaths for last year was, um, I'm not seeing the figure, but it was much less than for this year, the, the, the post-mortem cases. Huh? Okay. Um, so the, yeah, the, the, Homicide 
it's just one manner of death that that represents about i think uh less than quarter of the total types of autopsies that our doctors perform we have three medical examiners that performed all those 550 autopsies along with the support staff no? um the, the leading manner type of manner of death that the forensic department investigates is natural death actually um so we, we we focus on the homicides for crime statistics yes but our staff we have to investigate every sudden unexpected or unexplained or suspicious deaths so, so if, majority if, if somebody dies at home yes um, then you have to you have to do the autopsy to be sure whether or not it's natural causes or anything else sinister may have taken place. Yes, unless the person has a documented medical history that a physician has been attending to them and okay. if it, the physician knows that they had a, for instance, a, a terminal condition. Um, but yes, if they just um, fall, uh, unfortunately, and have a sudden death at home or somewhere else or traffic accident or drowning, um, suicide, those are all the types of deaths that, that our medical examiners have to investigate. Yeah. But typically, natural causes are the leading cause. Um, this year, we saw also accidental deaths increase. Um, more, mainly in the last quarter of the year, we had a little spike in road traffic uh, fatalities. Okay. Um, and then homicides is the third leading category that we, we typically see. Mm -hmm. um, this year, like I mentioned, suicide is also elevated. There is a, a category that's elevated. So the, there's, there's a, a lot of unseen work that our forensic staff do, um, yeah. not only to support the law enforcement agencies, but I mean, data like this that we share with the Ministry of Health is important epidemiological data so that we can try to look at the, the deeper causes of some of these fatalities. What's the most concerning trend you would say has been identified in 2021? Um, the suicide, definitely, uh, the increase in suicide um, in the later quarters of the year i think the last quarter of the year um like i mentioned previously we saw a spike in accidental deaths uh, mainly road traffic accidents um the for the homicides the third quarter had the highest um figure mm. and well for suicides so what we've seen interestingly over the years the first quarter of the year january for march that's when the, the suicide rate tends to be higher than the other quarters mm. And well, natural deaths, um, it's it's been the same same trend that we see over the years. We have a the increase, a gradual increase in natural deaths towards the last quarter of the year. October, November, December, that's when you have most of the fatalities due to um, morbidities, um, hypertension, stroke, heart attacks. Um, so th those usually peak toward the ending of the year. And we saw that again this year, or in 2021. This is why having hard data is so critical because you just mm -hmm. opened up a whole kind other of level of conversations <laughs> yes. in trends that you've seen. Um, but I, I do want to move on. We have Rogelio with us um, uh, to talk about the prison statistics. I know some of this information has already been published uh, on your end, uh, Ms. Maria, when we talk about the decline in, in prison population uh, for last year. But let's, let's talk about uh, what, what you're finding. Right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me again. Yes, um, like I, I had shared the numbers, like you said, Marlene, and um, what we saw for last year, um, particularly when you compared it with, with 2020, we did see um, major decreases in almost every category of crimes, um, with the exception of drug trafficking, which shot up by 80%. And this is as it relates to incarceration of course. And then we also saw immigration offenses that came down drastically by 41%. Mm. Um, or if you want to put a number to it, uh, for immigration, that would have been 117 less illegal immigrants uh, being sent to the prison. And with respect to drug trafficking, you're looking at 33 more uh, persons being sent to prison for the offense of drug trafficking. In every other category, there has been um, significant reduction um, right across. So that is what we're seeing for right, right now. Yeah. I, 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 one of the things I found interesting was the incarceration, um, let me get it right, uh, convictions for murder. Well, you know, typically you would not, um, at least for the last few years, you're not seeing any conviction for murder. 
Yeah. Um, normally, you would you would get a conviction, even though the person was charged for murder, you would get a conviction for manslaughter as yeah. opposed to murder, and that is why. So for them, I mean, to see them not being convicted of murder does not necessarily mean that they were not convicted in at all. Okay. Um, so you would want to, you know, look at the manslaughter statistics, and that will give you an idea more or less how many people got convicted uh, yeah. in the year for for manslaughter. And, um, or even cross-referencing with the number of cases. Right. Um, for argument's sake, let's say for last year, uh, the convictions for murder, um, there was only one person convicted of murder and three mm -hmm. were convicted of manslaughter last year. And more than likely, these are cases that probably have been dragging on for at least yeah. anywhere over two years. Yeah. Um, so it does not necessarily mean that it would be for a murder that may have taken place in 2020 or 2021, whatever the case may be. Yep. Now, given the fact that uh, 2020 um, uh, kind of slowed a lot of, of crime down, and then 2021 with loosening of restrictions, we saw some things start to, um, some of this type of uh, criminal activity resume. What would you say for you in the prison um, are some of the trends that you're seeing that, that concerns you? I mean, a decrease in population from the outside looking in is saying, good, we, we have less people committing crimes, uh, but the data doesn't really show that. Well, at the end of the day, I can only account for who comes to the prison. Um, and, you know, one thing I can tell you is that when anybody is sent to the prison, Whoever has a little stint to the prison, um, certainly we try to capitalize on the captive audience type thing. Yeah. Um, yeah so when once we have them here, uh, we try to get them engaged in programs. The remanded prisoners um, were recently uh, afforded the opportunity to participate in gang programs. Um, back in 2017, remember, we opened our Remands Rehab Center, which yes. we never had prior. And that looks after the issue of gangs. So when we have these states of emergency, um, we tend to try and educate them as much as possible. Um, we try to use a program called the New Freedom Program to that will guide them in getting out of that gang life and that kind of stuff. Um, so, but certainly, um, I can tell you, I don't know what much I can say about who is sent to the prison because all I can tell you is that, um, you know, Burglary definitely is one of the major crimes that we see people come into prison for. Yeah. Um, that, as a matter of fact, that is the the one and only offense. Uh, well, not necessarily burglary, but we call it crimes of dishonesty, and that would include robberies, burglary, theft, yeah. and and fraud and white collar crime, whatever you want to call it. But that accounts for most of the crime that we see on an annual basis, and that is from time immemorial. Um, so yeah. Let me, That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you if, if you have the information off the top of your head. That 7% decline, would that have been persons who were on remand, who went to court and, and were cleared of charges or completed the sentence? What would you say is the majority uh, to account for that loss there? It's a, it's a combination of many factors. Um, they are either given bail after waiting for quite a while for, um, for their murder charge. You will have people who have would have gone on parole because we do have 125 persons on parole currently. Mm. And certainly there are people who are completing their sentences and they're just not coming back. Okay. Um, so it's a combination of many, many things. Okay. Now, I didn't get to ask you this question, ASP Reese, and it is, it is um, a very critical one when we talk about gender-based violence. Um, what what would you say are are the concerns for you when you look at the data for 2021? Well, with, with respect to gender-based violence, that is part of our shortcomings because we cannot really, on the warrant, it would not necessarily say that a crime of murder or manslaughter or an act of violence, uh, maim, wounding, grievous harm, whatever the case may be, it, it, it does not say that it was as a result of a gender, of a domestic violence type thing. It would only say the person is being remanded for, 
for murder or for manslaughter or what have you. Yeah. Um, so it, this is where we have some problems. Um, so the prison does not necessarily get all of that detail. Yeah. Um, maybe at the conclusion of the case, then we would be afforded a copy of the conviction and the transcript. And then only then can we go now and pinpointedly say, all right, this was as a result of this and you could classify it as dom uh, domestic violence or gender-based violence type thing. Okay. ASP Reese? You may be on yes. mute. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh, the, the trends that concern you from the data you've seen from 2021? Um, well, when it comes to the trends from 2021, um, as we said, we've seen, of course, increase in um, physical violence is always one of our most um, prevalent case, um, the assaults, you know. So, um, and that is always constantly rising. That is one of our biggest concern when it comes to the trends, you know. Yes, we do have um, verbal and we do have of threats, but um, the physical violence has always been um, the, the, leading, the leading causes in all our cases. Yeah. You also, I think, note um, from 2020 that you are seeing, and, and I use this carefully, as an increase in number of male reports, male complaints. Um, yes. Two out of ten. Yes, we've seen an increase in that, but of course, it still remains majority um, women. Yeah. Yes, it still remains minimal compared to those made by women. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, I think we can keep going with this conversation. I, I yeah. was going to ask about the equipment in the forensics yeah. unit. Um, how have how have you been able to to use those equipment? Have you gotten new equipment? Mm -hmm. What is the status for twenty twenty one versus twenty twenty? Um, when it comes to using your newfound equipment? All right. Um, so, yeah, last year we received some equipment um, mainly well, from the Crime Observatory Collaboration for data gathering, data analysis. Um, but it, earlier in the year, we purchased some advanced laboratory equipment for toxicology. Um, this year, we're getting a donation of more advanced toxicology equipment um, as well as histopathology equipment or death investigation, so assist, to assist the medical examiners um, to do histology work. Um, and that is usually needed when the cause of death is difficult to see from microscopic observation, so they need either further toxicology tests or further histology tests to look at tissues to see for um, evidence of injuries, evidence of wounding that might not be um, visible to the naked eye. You know? So we're, we're getting that donated through a project um, coordinated by SICA, uh, those equipment uh, have been tendered out through the, the SICA um, donors. We should receive, um, I think it's estimated at over a quarter million um, US dollars. We should receive that later, probably by middle of this year. Um, so that once we have the, the equipment, we do have the staff with the capacity to do um, those analyses. We're, we're, we're just, we'll need more staff to replace um, the, the loss of manpower from their current duties. Um, but it's a it's a needed growth a needed yeah. step forward for forensics to so be able to support um stronger debt investigation um systems not only for criminal cases but also for the non-criminal cases yeah. um so yeah a lot to look forward to in 2021 in terms of um, the support that forensics provide to solving cases we're looking at the root causes of crime for the past year and trying to address those through the intervention um programs but we also from the forensic side and the criminal investigation side uh, and we, we are closely with the CIV branch of police. We also need to, to strengthen and, and um, de devote more resources to sol investigating and solving uh, some of the criminal offenses. Yeah, right. I just want to add one last thing, Marlene, to yes. answer your question about um, concerning trends. Um, mm -hmm. And we touched on it um, in the domestic violence um, aspect in terms of victims. Um, from the fatality side, in terms of victims uh, disaggregated by sex, um, I, I think it's no surprise that uh, males, a lot more males die um, due to violent deaths, due to accidental deaths, also due to natural deaths, also due to suicides um, than females. And for homicides, for instance, it's a tenfold difference, males versus females. For accidental deaths, <clears throat> sorry, it's about sixfold. Uh, male, six times more males die from accidental deaths than females. Uh, for natural deaths, it's about three times more males die than females. 
And for suicides, it's about uh, five times more than males and females. So males so were clearly overall at, more male, at more, more men died. Yes, off, wow. across all categories, and wow. that's again uh, a striking observation. That um, it, but it's it's honestly it's 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 a historical trend. Yeah. But we do need to look at again some of the the differences in in factors that contribute to that in these instances that may be preventable due to um, either gender based or, or or more biological aspects. Yeah, I'm happy that you brought that up because when we talk about deaths and we talk about gender based violence, we always shift our focus to to women because mm -hmm. you know those are the ones that complain the most they, we're the ones that make the report the most um and then we often don't look at statistics about the men that mm -hmm. that die in all of these other categories so i'm very happy that that you brought that up um and just to like drive it home um what are the upcoming projects that the forensic unit is taking on for 2022 all right. Um, so, well, we have three units of the forensic department. We have the medical examiner's office. So, we're like I said, we're trying to, to grow um, or to add a, a additional uh, types of um, further testing, histology testing. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to increase the staff in the, the medical examiner's office. Currently, we only have three medical examiners, um, but we do need a lot of support staff. Huh. Um, the use of morgues um, to conduct all of these forensic post-mortem examinations. Um, the, the medical examiners don't um, are not in control of their own morgue. We are um, basically tenants of morgues across the country, but it does provide a lot of challenges, logistic and operational challenges in terms of storage of equipment, um, custody of evidence, custody of bodies, admission and release of bodies, etc. Um, this year, we're looking to have a needs assessment followed by an architect architectural design conducted for the long-awaited CABE loan agreement that was to, is to provide a new forensic morgue and a new forensic laboratory. Um, it won't be constructed this year. I uh, note my words, I said we're looking for the needs assessment and the architectural <laughs> design to be completed by the ending of this year. Um, the, the CABE loan process, there's a lot of uh, checks and balances um, and on the flip side of that, it slows down some of the, the implementation, but I mean, they, they, they needed checks and balances, but it's been eight years, coming up to eight years now that that loan um, agreement was signed back in 2014. Uh, we still have yet to, to see um, tangible um, deliverables from the, the loan, including equipment. Um, but we did have one um, tender review committee already to, to look at equipment. Um, this year, like I said, the, the tender should go out for a qualified firm to study the department, to look at the needs, the current operations, where the forensic department needs to go in the next 20 years, and to provide um, a plan, an architectural plan for design of new facilities, not only for the medical examiners, but for the forensic laboratory. Yeah. Wow. The laboratory what? is one of the other two units um, for the department, and we do have a lot of plans in terms of um, rolling out quality systems, in terms of new staff, um, we also, looking to increase our outsourcing of DNA cases. Last year, we outsourced about 20 um, cases to a, a laboratory in the USA. Um, we want to steadily increase that every year until such time okay. that we can actually add DNA to the scope of the department. Gian, we got to get and, you back because yeah, there sorry. is a yes. lot to talk <laughs> yes. about. Yes. I know. I, I want to <laughs> say, though, um, you know, this was really a, re, a, a power packed group here and I wish we got to dive into these separately at some point yeah. in time. But today yeah. was an opportunity to get an overview of trends. And Adelia, thank you so much for helping us uh, or in providing the data. I think what really was underscored is the fact that um, there is sufficient data to drive uh, data driven decision making. But mm -hmm. while we have the quantitative, they're definitely, I mean, who does the qualitative? Can you close off with that one, Adeli? With respect to the qualitative data analysis, that's an area definitely where more emphasis is needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of things in the pipeline for the Crime Observatory and the partner agencies. And maybe I could close on that point. Yeah. Because, for example, during 2021, there was a conversation started on conducting Belize's first national crime victimization survey. Mm. And so this has been engaging partners such as the UNODC, 
Galen University, UNDP, InfoSegura, which has provided initial financial support to get this off the ground. Another thing that is happening through the InfoSegura project funded by USAID is the provision of software, hardware. You know, you, you can have your, your analysts trained, you can have your personnel in-house, but if you're not current with innovation and technology, yeah. then the work is still just vastly manual. And so one of the things that we're looking at is to build in a lot of automation so that the data is shared more readily, is available more quickly, more real-time analytics are available to your heads of departments, yeah. you know, your partner agencies, even, for example, the international development partners who work and collaborate along with national level agencies to plan interventions on the ground. And it could be a simple thing like, for example, looking at getting the data to design a project. For yeah. example, the Spotlight Initiative mm -hmm. utilized the domestic violence data and the visualizations that came out of the observatory, but that came from the police department. And so you see where the data really goes a, yeah. a long yeah. way. And, yeah. and when you when you put the, the geospatial or when, when you put it on a map, then you can even see where hot spots are um, exactly. and, and know where you need to concentrate your focus. Yeah. This has been a really informative conversation. I appreciate all of you for taking your time out to have it. And clearly we can expand yeah. on this uh, very soon as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. We really appreciate All the right. time All right. that Thank you've given you. us a chair. Thank you. And with that, we are going to take our next break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about art therapy. Stick around. Stay tuned.